Welcome to the Layman Seminary. Today we're going to be examining whether this statement is true. You may have heard some Christians uh, use this statement, and we're going to be examining this statement in detail. Um, so not all disciples are sons, and not all sons are disciples. Uh, or you might hear some people say not all disciples are Christians, uh, uh, and not all Christians are disciples, you know, variations of that. Now, the question is, is this true? Now, in order to answer that question, we have to think about actually what this sentence is doing or attempting to do. Okay, so as we begin, we need to consider the possibility that it's saying that there are positionally unsaved disciples. For y'all that know my video, I use the word positional uh, experience and ultimate. The three different categories here let me draw them out just so you can see them so position experience and ultimate traditionally for what some people call justification sanctification glorification but i believe that those words uh, occur in the different categories as well so there are positionally unsaved disciples. So we could say that there's a subcategory. Let me use a different color here. There's a subcategory within position. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. Okay. And then positionally unsaved, of course, would be in Adam. And so whenever you're talking about positionally unsaved uh, disciples, they would go in this category right here. Okay. Let me bring this down so we can see it. Um, probably need to make that a uh, little bit bigger. Yeah, that's a lot better. Okay, so this passage, Matthew twenty two fifteen, is talking about the Pharisees. Now, for the sake of argument, I'm assuming that the Pharisees are not saved in this passage. Most of the people don't think they're saved because of how they're acting. Um, but I don't think that you can make that decision definitively based on how they're acting. But more on that later. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said, talking about Jesus. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you're truthful and teach the way of God and truth and defer to no one for you are not partial to any. And so the point is the Pharisees are sending their disciples. So this is an example that the Pharisees are not saved of unsaved disciples because the word disciple just means a learner or a student that physically followed a person at that time, but even if you don't physically follow, you could be a, still a learner or a student in the other sense. Okay, so let me clear the drawing. All right. Um, more examples of there being positionally unsaved disciples are Judas. So here's some passages that call that say that he's one of the 12 and the 12 being the disciples. And so statements concerning that the reason i say judas is not saved is mainly because of this passage right here luke 22 2 and satan entered into judas who was called iscariot belonging to the number of the 12 now if you think that, that christians can be demon possessed or believers can be demon possessed then you will have a different interpretation of this passage but what's also interesting in this passage is the actions of this possessed individual. Uh, he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him and to them uh, apart from the crowd. So it's interesting that, I mean, whenever you think about a demon possessed person, you don't usually think about them consenting with other people and being able to argue. Now. Is Satan shrewd and all of that? And could he be the one that's consenting here? It's possible, but it sounds like it's actually describing Satan having some type of strong influence over him uh, and that, that basically leads him to do this. So Satan entered into Judas. Does that mean he possessed him physically? What is demon possession? I know that's a whole other topic, but my point is that's going to affect how you view things. And if you say, well, no, there is no example of uh, a positionally unsaved disciple uh, in Judas, then go back to the Pharisee thing. It's kind of weird. People would 
probably say that those Pharisees were not saved before some of them that I've encountered would say that Judas was not saved. But I I would say this, that the, my, the most Christians don't believe Judas was saved. But going on, there are positionally saved people that don't engage in experiential discipleship. So just to draw our chart once more, okay, we have position, experience, and ultimate. So this one is saying that there's positionally saved people. So they're in Christ. I won't make the subcategory in Adam, but they're positionally saved, okay? And that don't engage in experiential discipleship. So this is experiential discipleship right here. So you can be saved, but not be involved in discipleship. And what I mean by involved in discipleship is either receiving discipleship or giving discipleship or discipling others. Um, so that's what that statement's claiming to do. Okay. Now we can evaluate that in John uh, 8, 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him. So they positionally saved. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine or disciples indeed. So the qualification is not a positional belief, but it's continuing in his word that one is seen to be truly a disciple. Now, you can make the argument that one is a disciple uh, in and that he's given a new status of salvation that, that refers to his uh, ministry. So if you want to think of it like this. Uh, I didn't plan to go into this, but let me try to clarify this, okay? I'm going to talk about the body of Christ. I'm going to talk about the Christian for right now. All right, so here's our chart. Position, experience, and ultimate. Okay? When you believe in Christ, you're seated in the heavenlies in Christ. Your position is now in Christ. But you're also given a spiritual gift, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the word gift and in office interchangeably here for simplistic reasons, but I don't actually believe they're the same thing, okay? But let's say when you believe in Christ, you're put into Christ, right? And you receive your spiritual gifts. And let's say at the, at the moment of salvation, your spiritual gift is teacher, okay? So in the body of Christ, your function, your role is a teacher okay but you don't always act as a teacher in fellowship with god you may act as a teacher out of fellowship with god doing it in your own strength so what i'm trying to say is that there's a similarity let me change the color so we can see the connection with the with the idea of a teacher let's replace it with the d for disciple so even though you're saved, you're given the, the role or the function of being a disciple in this most technical sense that this is talking about, the 12, in other words, in D12, if you want. Uh, that's a, a, a hip-hop reference. But anyway, um, so you have uh, the, the disciples positional, okay? But you can either disciple in the spirit or you can disciple in the flesh. In other words, why you're in fellowship with God or not. So the point is, is that just because you've been given the role in the body of Christ does not mean you function as such. In other words, you could say it like this. You could say that while you are uh, a, a disciple in this sense, right? You're a positional disciple, I guess you could say. You're not always an experiential disciple, or as this passage says, truly a disciple or disciple indeed. I mean, a true disciple is a one that 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 not just merely passive learns and doesn't apply the word, but one that actively learns and applies the word. So you could think of it like that. Okay. Um, there's another sense in which discipleship can be used in a positional sense even for salvation, but I'll deal with that in a minute, okay? Let me clear this. All right, on to the next one. So going to this statement, not all disciples are sons and not all sons are disciples. 
Well, we saw earlier that not all disciples are sons in a sense of believers because the Pharisees, assuming they were lost, and Judas, assuming he's uh, lost or never saved, then they were disciples, but they weren't saved. They weren't sons. And then we see in John 8 that not all sons in the sense of belief are disciples. Now, the exact words are not there, but the concepts are. Anyway. Another way to think about it is this, is if, I, if, if we did take this statement and say all disciples are sons, okay, people that see no distinction between discipleship and sonship in, in, in positional sense uh, or however since they do it, they would say that all disciples are sons or all sons are disciples, okay? And so whether you put the D first or the S or the S and the D really can't tell the difference. The point is, is that you end up with one circle because uh, there, it, the, the, the two concepts would be discipleship and sonship lay right on top of each other. There's no overlap because there's no distinction in this view. I don't agree with this view, but some people, when they're reading the Bible, they use these words exactly interchangeably. And so I want you to be aware of that. Then the opposite of that are no disciples are sons. Okay. So you have the disciple word here, and then you have the son word here, but notice they're separate circles. There's no overlap. Okay. Or no sons are disciples. Same thing. No overlap. Okay. Now this is where it's going to really bring home what I'm saying. So you got the word son right here, right? This is a Venn diagram. You have the word son here and you got the word disciple. And the way it works is that the part that's out here like this, this is unique. The part that's on the outside, that's unique. But there's an overlap right there. So you can say that in these areas, there is overlap. So you can actually say some sons are disciples and some disciples are sons. Okay, some sons are disciples and some disciples are sons just by going in that general idea. But it goes deeper than that. Because whenever we're talking about sonship, we're talking about position, experience, and ultimate. And when we're talking about a disciple or a discipleship, we're also talking about position, experience, and ultimate. That means that there could be both distinction and or overlap in these three categories for each word okay so i made a video i think this was november 20th uh charting sonship and discipleship and this was responding uh to somebody's video online that was going through it and this particular video just went right down his list i mean right right down the the structure uh, of his talk and 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 analyze that so you can go back and see it but that was one of the things that I addressed early on is, is the distinction between the sonship and discipleship and the overlap. And I, the reason I'm revisiting this is because there's some people that have made the argument that uh, there is no distinction, okay? Or that the distinction is not, there's no basis in that distinction. And, and it's just really interesting how many people were actually swayed by that within the, I guess you could say, StreamYard community, uh, however you want to call it. Um, it's not Google Plus anymore. It's a Hangout. Um, so what I attempted to do in this video was uh, refute that particular video without attacking the person. So you can hear the arguments, but I don't think you'll hear a person mentioned there. Um, and it gives you an idea how you can use this chart to examine what other people say, as well as how you understand scripture. Um, the, the, so my point is showing this is that I had already addressed this way back in November 20th, and it's still an issue today, and it's in the month of February right now. So, um, you know, whenever I make videos, a lot of people are not going to watch them, at least not initially, you know, because I'm, I, mine's a discipleship channel, mine's a, a training channel and so i try to deal with issues without getting caught up in the controversy um and so i don't put usually i don't 
I don't think I've done it yet, put a particular name in the title to catch attention or things like that. And I'm not saying that because I'm better than those people that do do that. I'm just explaining why some of those people have not seen this video, even though November, December, January, it's over two months old, you know, where I had already addressed this in part. Okay, so this is my chart. I got my concept and word here. Uh, I got a, the gloss for, the, now what I've done different in this chart is you'll see in a minute that I look up the word sun in the authorized version. In other words, the King James. I'm using the King James not because I'm King James only, but because some of the people that are watching this video that I'm particularly uh, making this video to help them understand some things are King James only or King James priority. So I'm starting there. I'm not ending up there. And uh, so what I did was I in Logos, I looked up the word sun and found all the Greek words that are used to translate sun. And uh, so I got the gloss right here. Then I have position, experience, and ultimate. And then I have the categories of what's going on here and for, for each one. And the same thing with the word disciple, the word that's being used here. Now, um, I'm going to explain this a little bit. But sun, in this sense, would be regeneration, okay? Uh, positional regeneration. Uh, this would be adoption, positional adoption, and um, and the and technon child can be regeneration as well. And this one right here, pais, it could be slave, servant, or child. So you have the idea of service or physical sonship and adoption, and then you have a word that's translated for cousin, which refers to relative. Now, what you'll see is that in the experience is that um, the, uh, all of these have to do with, in the experience, imitation and obedience or disobedience that um, earns or loses inheritance. I put earn inheritance, should have put loss inheritance as well. And so though I saw all of that. Now, for the relative one, I really didn't see that unless you're talking about a familial inheritance in some type of way. Um, and then for the ultimate category, you got perfect representation because we don't have a sin nature at that time. We have glorified bodies and you get to experience the inheritance that you earned here. And so that fit through there, except for the relative idea, unless it's a physical. Now for the, the learning aspect, there is a positional learning in the sense that you learn the gospel to be positionally saved. Okay. And so th that allows for these three words. Um, but you'll have to study it in context to see if they fit in it. I haven't uh, analyzed the scriptures that relate to this. So I want that qualifier mentioned. Now for the experience, learning the Bible as part of experiential sanctification, which is imitation and obedience or disobedience to earn inheritance. So that idea comes in right here. And then in the ultimate category, when we have a glorified body, learning the Bible while a perfect representative, perfect representation and experience and inheritance. So those fit. So you can see here how they're zoomed in here. And you can see one of the issues here. This word right here introduces the concept of service, even though it could be translated as child. Um, the issue of relative, it, it's not going to have any bearing on our conversation right now, except maybe for the physical now, uh, the basis for some of the physical analogy for inheritance. If you take the view that that type of inheritance is in scripture. Okay, so here we are, position, experience, and ultimate, and I had just explained this to y'all. This is just blown up so you can see it better. Now, this is another way to put it. Here's sonship, okay? Remember, we have the Venn diagram with the two overlapping circles, so this is one side of it. I don't know how to do the mirror image stuff. Uh, otherwise, I would have put them back to back facing like that, but I don't know how to do that yet. I'll learn. So this is sonship. So this means that there's a position, experience, and ultimate aspect of sonship. And you see that I have those uh, options, regeneration, adoption, physical sonship, relative, or service here. Then experience, you have imitation or obedience or disobedience to earn inheritance or lost inheritance, and then none of relative. And then ultimate perfect representation, experience, inheritance, none if relative. So I'm just showing you another way 
to to uh, visualize what I was showing on the previous slide uh, concerning all of this. Okay. Now here's discipleship, position, experience, and ultimate position. Your your uh, discipleship is involved. Positional discipleship is involved because you learn the gospel to be positionally saved. Experiential discipleship is involved because of learning the Bible, part of experiential sanctification, imitation. Ultimate is learning the Bible while perfect representative, you know, you had a glorified body, perfect representation and experiencing that inheritance. So another way, I added some other factors here, just so I can draw on here and point these out, is you have sonship right here, you have discipleship right here, but then I use the word believer. Because believer can be used in different ways, position, experience, and ultimate. And the word servant, I think, can even be used uh, maybe in the sense of position, experience, ultimate, or at least experience and ultimate. But I think position might work in some context. Uh, I usually leave it experience and ultimate. But so what you see here is that positional sonship, positional discipleship, positional belief, and then positional servanthood, you could maybe do something like that. Then, but here, experiential sonship, experiential discipleship, experience of a believer, experience of service. And then the ultimate category, ultimate sonship, ultimate discipleship, ultimate believer. Uh, not sure exactly what that would be. Maybe seeing is believing or something. I'm not sure. Um and then ultimate servant. So we're just looking at the possibilities, just to think about uh, what our options are, you know. And the main reason that I included those other words is just to be aware that this doesn't just work with sonship and discipleship. And plus, there was four nodes already, and I'm like, well, I might as well just go with that. Okay, so this is the authorized version, the King James count of all the times the word son occurs in scripture. And, you know, the, the ones where it shows up a whole lot usually involve genealogies and all that. This is zoomed in for the Old Testament only, so you can get a little bit more perspective of that. This is the New Testament. You can get a bit less perspective, but you don't see the numbers, but I do have them right here. This is the New Testament only. So in the Gospel of Luke, son shows up, looks like almost 150 times, probably because of the genealogy um matthew next to that and you can see where hebrews uses the word a lot first john uses it a lot galatians uses it a lot and the others are eh, it's not used that much romans is used some acts is used okay so here's what here's the here's the information that i actually analyzed before i made those charts that i put up front in the video so here's son Weos, Technon, Pice, Weothasia for adoption, Anaphesus, Theseus, co uh, cousin, and Ace Weos for son. All right. And this is an example, Hebrews 1 5, where uh, I want my son, I begotten thee again. I will say to him, Father, he shall be to me a son. Uh, so that's adoption. I don't think this is positional because um, we're talking about Christ, but. The idea is related. Um, here's we asked the word range and the different options. You could be a person, a male descendant, people as in children, children as the sons, a child, a trust in Jesus, a wedding guest, a descendant of Abraham, a disciple. See the overlap with disciple here? Son, uh, humankind. And so here's those ranges of meanings as well. And then the one on disciple is Matthew 12, 27. If by Beelzebub cast out demons. I by Beelzebub cast out demons. By whom do your sons cast them out? Talking about the Pharisees. So they're taking this to refer to discipleship in that sense. Okay, here's our word technon, which also translates to son. It could be child as an endearment, as a kind a person category, a descendant of Abraham, uh, different uses of it. And here's several different passages wherever it's being used both uh, from the New Testament forward. And that's another thing. This video, of course, is not going into Old Testament analysis of the Hebrew. I would do that at a, at a later date, probably connect that with my final destiny. I think that 
looking at the Greek is sufficient for the need uh, that is pressing on in this community to know about this information. Okay, so here's Pice, boy, slave, child, young, uh, a young child. Okay, and you can see these are examples where that word is used. Thy son lives, glorified his son Jesus unto you first. God has raised up his son. So you can see it's referring to uh, the son is in Jesus. Um, this is the word for adoption. You see that in that translation, which is the authorized, it always translates this word as adoption. Um, in Galatians 4, 5, so that he might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Okay, this is the word anaphesias, I guess is what it is, uh, for cousin. So it's always translated as cousin in that translation. The Colossians 4.10, Aristarch, Aristarch, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings and also Barnabas' cousin, Mark, about whom you receive instructions, it becomes you welcome him. So there's the word for cousin. And then now we're going into the word for disciple at, out of the authorized version. This is the 1873. Um, so mathetes, mathetuo, mathetria. So this is a female disciple. This is be a disciple. And you can see where these are being used. Mathetes is used for disciple, learner. Uh, in that translation, method two o to be a disciple, to be disciple, to disciple, and then Matthew twenty seven fifty seven, uh, and this is for Matthew two o. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Armathia named Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. So this is one; he was one of the secret disciples, as well as Nathaniel. I think it mentions in another place. So this is the word for a female disciple, and this is used right here. In Acts 9. Now, when Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness, charity, which she continually did. Okay, so here's the summary. Here's the takeaway from this. There are three possible aspects to sonship, and that's running it through the relationships that we show. And there are also three possible aspects to discipleship. The question is, do you find either either of these, either explicit or implicit support to fill these slots. I mean, if you don't find a place where sonship should go in position, experience, or ultimate, don't put it there. Same thing with the word discipleship. But hopefully this video will help you in your personal study. You can see, okay, what words to do, and maybe it will inspire you as the method. There's so much more that I can do, but I'm probably going to make some more videos in this same vein dealing with overlaps and certain words. Um, for example, the distinction between what some call objective lordship and subjective lordship. Um, let's see what else terms I wanna talk about. Um, I think maybe even repentance is probably one that needs to be clarified. So if anyway, if you've been blessed by this video, subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell if you want notification. Give us a thumbs up if you like it. Uh, share this with others, but most of all, keep this ministry in prayer. God bless.